Oh, hello. That's uh, oh. vanished there. Sorry. The point about high culture, anyway, is you're not producing something to entertain. You're producing something to say something deep about the human condition. And as you um, experience high culture, you should be experiencing it in a distanced way. You don't want to feel too close to it. You should be looking at it as an objective observer. Now, uh, Mark, is there? Sorry. Sorry, the technology, as usual, has, uh, has failed here. You can see if you could find some from the, uh, yeah. the combo, that would be great. So we, we, break it, we, we break it down into high culture and low culture. High culture, it's the sort of thing you experience um, very objectively. It uh, tends to be um, associated with literature, high art, and it tends to be something which is quite um, elite. It's not something that is experienced and enjoyed by the masses. Now we compare that to popular culture or mass culture, and this is seen as something that's empty. It's produced very quickly, it's produced to sell products, and it's produced just really to entertain people. Perhaps to make us feel okay about the dullness of our lives, but not to reveal anything about the human condition. So you've got those two ideas of culture. Fans are very much associated with low culture. And therefore when the media begins to report on fandom activities in the 1960s, they tend to view fans as deluded. They view fans as cultural dupes. People who are willing to buy any sort of rubbish if it is branded with the, uh, the mark of the thing that they love. Ah, it's back, fantastic. And that's, now, what, and that's what The Simpsons joked about, wasn't it? It is, exactly. So The Simpsons is a really good uh, example of this. Now, has anybody seen this sketch from Saturday Night Live? No. So, so yeah, I, I heard a few people say yes. This is a very famous sketch from the uh, mid-80s. William Shatner goes along to a Star Trek convention, and um, he's there, he, he's taking part, and he's, at the end he's so fed up with the questions about sort of what uniform Kirk was wearing, what the uh, uh, combination was to his safe, that he tells the fans, get a life. He says, you need to move out of your parents' bedrooms, you need to start kissing women, you need to basically grow up. And Never. This, this is often used as an example of how fans are portrayed in the popular media. So, what we see in, um, in that clip, oh, thank you very much, is that fans are obsessed with stuff which is useless. Nobody cares about the sort of things that fans care about. The correct sort of uniform that Captain Kirk is wearing, for example. They're childish. They're in a state of arrested development. They're still living with their parents. They're unable to get girlfriends. And they can't differentiate between fiction and reality. So this is a big part of the critique of fandom. You say people, they, they don't know when something is fiction and they mix it up with their real lives. And of course, they will buy any old rubbish. So, um, Chapman himself is a good example of this in, in that he marketed off the back of his rollers cut his wonderful singing career, which, uh, has, have people heard um, William Shatner's album? No. <laughs> Well, if you said no, make sure you listen to it, because it is uh, an amazing experience. Um, transformative, I would say, as, uh, as Kirk is being transformed there. Now, of course, over the last 20 years or so, fans have become much more mainstream. So we have things like the Big Bang Theory, which is quite positive about geek culture. But um, even as that's developed, there's a sort of hierarchy within fandoms developing as well. So this is, uh, this is from um, Comic Con back, um, in, I think it was in 2010 or so, um, where fans of what, what are seen as respectable properties, so things like um, comic books and graphic novels, uh, the 
um, sci-fi movies, protested at the fact that Twilight, and this is of course the book Twilight, uh, they protested at the fact that Twilight was promoted to sort of the main con event and the main con hall. And one of the things that they were doing there was that they were playing into this kind of divide. In that what was wrong with Twilight was it wasn't real science fiction, it wasn't real fantasy, and the fans were not real fans. Because, and we see the same criticisms emerging, the fans were childish, because the fans were mostly female, and because the quality of the things they liked, it wasn't up to the high art and the high culture of these fans, belief and focus on science fiction and focus on things like Star Trek or um, the Marvel comics or what have you. So, if we've got that hierarchy of fandom taking place, Twilight is placed at the bottom because it's feminine, because it's childish, because it's not something that you would expect to form an obsessive fandom about. And um, I won't walk, talk you through all this, but this is a, a sort of humorous hierarchy of fandoms that has been, that's, have been drawn up. So you can see literary science fiction fans at the top and furries down at the bottom. And I'm sure you'll all know if you've seen um, debates online, this kind of drawing up divisions between different fandoms. So then we come to My Little Pony. Well, My Little Pony, if we're thinking about something that's going to form a fandom, is going to be deeply problematic. And it's deeply problematic on three levels. Firstly, it's designed to sell toys. So it's already very commercial. And if it's commercial, you you're immediately thinking, well, it's not going to be art, it's not going to tell us anything about, um, about what it means to be human, about the sort of things we might get out of yeah, high boy, I, science I really fiction know. writing, for example. Yeah. Secondly, you can't imagine anything more feminized than this. You can see the sort of designs of the ponies. Uh, this is not something designed for a, an adult male fan base that usually forms the backdrop of popular culture fandoms. And the fact that it's aimed particularly not just at women, but at young girls, means that it's right at the bottom of the cultural hierarchy. So you don't expect anything out of My Little Pony. And when I talk about My Little Pony here, I'm not just talking about G4, I'm talking about right back to G1, and the image that you get um, as that is produced as well. Because Sometimes, as bronies, we can think that we are, of course, the first generation of fans, but that's not true. The, uh, there's, there's a whole other generation of My Little Pony fans out there back from the 1980s. So when people start reporting about My Little Pony, immediately you see it um, criticised as being empty, as being overly commercial. So this is the review from The Times of the first My Little Pony film, which came out in 1986. And they don't even bother to review the film. They don't even bother to think of, through the plot or the characters. It, it's just a toy commercial. It's just designed to sell merchandise. And of course, if you get... How many people have seen the G1 cartoons? So yeah, quite, quite, quite a few of you. When, when you get into them, you it's see amazing. that um, they're not necessarily empty, that you need to actually pay attention. There are characters, there are plots, and they can be quite dark. So I think Spike, they threaten to behead Spike within half yeah. an hour of the first episode, which I, I don't think, has that happened in G4 yet? No, no. but the, but the chaining of the ponies did. That's true. So there are good connections between G1 and G4 there. When people begin to talk about fans in the press, and they, when they talk about G1 fans, they tend to talk about collectors, though. And a lot of the reporting here, it plays into these sort of stereotypes as fans as obsessive, as fans of having to justify their fandom. So you can see a couple of quotations there. This is from one of the encyclopedias of cartoons, which is very respectful of fans of animation, but when it comes to My Little Pony, it says, well, you have these otherwise rational women who are still hanging on to all of their ponies. And the author here is, is basically saying, well, 
why, why aren't these people growing up? Why are they keeping hold of these ponies as they get into adulthood? Hello everyone, I am back from Griffish Isles in Manchester. Um, the question is, why am I back in my flat? Well, two things. One, my camera was on the verge of dying, so I don't think it would have enough juice left to uh, finish the whole convention. And actually, an extra reason. Another reason is because one of my events was had a clash between the Skype call with Lee, uh, Lee Toka, who is the voice of Snips, uh, Stephen Magnet, Saffron Masala's father, and a diamond dog. He was he was a diamond dog. Must pony. Must must pony. Must. So. I think I've mentioned that I would film the Lee Toka panel, but sorry to disappoint, <laughs> that panel clashed between the Buckball game, which I was in charge of, and that was from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock or 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock because finding the Power League was which is like um, a football venue or sports venue that was not easy to find and I kind of made it in time like say 15 minutes on time which was pretty good but I couldn't film the Lee Tokar Skype call panel because yeah my uh, camera was on the verge of dying and it was a clash but anyway Griffish Isles is over I must say I, I enjoyed myself despite the buckball one but hey that can be improved next year ne ne next year Griffish Isles next year bear that in mind next year okay if you want to see the Lee Tokar Skype panel you can watch that on Mark Hyder's channel which I will give you now but hey we may not have seen Lee Tokar in my channel but this time, I managed to see her. She was on the mystery voice panel in Heartwarming Con 2018 in February, which I didn't get to see because I wasn't aware of that. But here, she is. You know her name. Here she is now. Yes, Pepper. <laughs> and you've got Ellie there, so I'm sure you have a first hand example of another. <laughs> so, uh, I just want to wish you all a lovely uh, convention. Uh, an unconventional convention. Um, oh, no, 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 it's almost all the way around my head. <laughs> Oh, I have to go on ahead. 
Bye. Now, the next thing. You're probably wondering what merchandise I bought from Griffith Isles. Well, first of all, I have a portrait of Ember, the Dragon Lord. She is quite a nice dragon. Although, in my opinion, the front angle of the camera doesn't agree with her. <laughs> Why is that? Well, maybe it's because of the horns, you know, going downward instead of upward. Because mo most dragons' horns are upward, you know, like with cows and bulls. But, um, seeing Ember front angle of the camera is doesn't really uh, agree with her, in my, in my opinion. But, hey, we all have different opinions, don't we? But uh, she looks good in this one, I think. Anyway, moving on. I have bought this Rainbow Dash badge here. Because she is my favourite pony. And I want her to be by my side always. Other than a tattoo, which I will not get a tattoo. Even though I do get tempted at times, but I will not put a tattoo on myself. Because you know how wrong they can be. Here is my favourite crusader. Michelle, if you're watching this. Here is a character of yours without a cutie mark. So it must be the older version of Apple Bloom. From old seasons, I mean. Here, I didn't buy this. I was given this by another friend of mine who is a, the fiancé of Mark Hyder, who is also a friend of mine. This is the Generation 1 Applejack from Rescue at Midnight Castle in 1984. Voiced by Sandy Duncan, who also voiced Firefly. The Generation 1 version of Rainbow Dash, which Lauren Forst actually based Rainbow Dash on. I have also bought this as well. It would have been nice if it was free, but it wasn't to be this time. The Griffish Isles 2018 as a monument of my experience. And hopefully there'll be one in 2019. Okay, next. I was also given this Generation 3 Pinkie Pie, who was at the time the main character of Generation 3, My Little Pony from 2003 to 2009 even though 2009 is classed as the G3.5 but it's still generation 3 in a way because for example like G4 is now um, 2010 to now but on the movie that was released last year that would have been classed as G4.5 so, yep, 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 yes, 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 and um, that's not, this is not Razaru, this is Pinkie Pie. Pinkie Pie of Generation 3, voiced by Janice Jord. And, for the third time, my name is on the con book, as you can see. Thomas... Sally Hoofster, who is my OC pony, met him. And here as well is Jesse's OC name, Gothica, and Mark Hyder's OC, Gallop Crush, and also Mark Hyder as well in brackets. I was also given by Jesse. This shiny Pinkie Pie card, 
Now I'm told these are quite rare. These are very rare. And uh, she was she was in charge of the ECC My Little Pony card game, and yeah, she just out of generosity, rarity, gave me this, which was very nice of her. Thank you, Jessie. Thank you very much. Have a little. Well everyone, I'm going to end this video now. I hope you enjoyed it. Please, please send comments. I would love to read them all. Because... I'm just getting the feeling that nobody cares about the videos that I make. Because I mean, I, tr I, I tried to bring out the best material for you guys. But it just seems that nobody cares. It's like I'm expecting like, oh I don't know on my Apple blooper videos oh that, that was my favorite scene on that when it when that video was on uh, that definitely was the best flight I agree on the Manchester vid on the Manchester Airport videos wow look at the side look at that parade bus that was that, that looks that seemed to be passionate from the Accrington Ac Stanley fans, you know? So please, please give comments, please give likes, because at times I just feel like giving up. I just feel like, what's the point in doing my T-Log videos if no one gives a damn about them? So that's what I'm asking you to do. Please. It doesn't take, like, a whole day just to give out a comment. It only takes about a minute or two just to give out a good comment, you know? I know, I'm, I know it seems I'm asking for a lot, but please, please show that you care. Because I do try and entertain you all. I mean, that Disney firework display, and it illumination display that I filmed last year. I would have thought that would have been one of my most popular videos that I filmed. I would have thought it would have been the best video that I filmed. But no, it wasn't. Instead, my apparently my most popular video was my Our Mr. Stay Poppy Day service in Manchester last year and that had over 200 views no comments but over 200 views not many likes either but maybe this will change maybe this will bring hope into why I do my channel in the first place I mean I can't I can't do vlogs all the time. I mean, I'm not that type of person. I'm, I'm only vlogging for special events that I do. Special trips. That's why I do the videos. That's why I do them. For, for special trips and special occasions. Like, who knows, maybe on my 30th birthday in October Yes, I will. That's right. I will be. T I'll be turning thirty in October. So you may see a video about that. Maybe Applejack. So please, yeah, please, please. I will end this video now. I will end this tea log, like I do with all my tea logs, by saying, bro hoof. And goodbye.